Uh, one second, let me agree to that. Okay. Um, and yeah, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, developer advocacy, it's basically people that um, write blogs and tutorials, um, create demos for how to use technology with other pieces and other components and different stacks, um, answer community questions on forums and Slack, uh, give webinars like these, um, go to conferences, um, and sometimes contribute to docs or the product itself or uh, other open source projects as well. Uh, so a little bit of a lot of different things, just depending on kind of what you want to focus on. But with the main goal of like helping enable users um, and also giving product feedback, um, ideally. Uh, so yeah, um, but today I'm going to talk about um, using InfluxDB with OpenTelemetry and Jaeger. Um, and uh, I will say I am, ha have never been a DevOps engineer. So um, yeah, just uh, something to know about me. Um, but that being said, this was still a pretty easy um, demo to follow. And I encourage you to try it out too, if you want to for yourself and we'll, we'll go over it as well. Um, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you're free to do so. I encourage you to. And if you have any questions about InfluxDB or anything in this presentation, you're more than welcome to reach out to me there. You're also highly encouraged to reach out to me on our forums, um, community.influxdata.com or uh, our Slack channel, Influx Community, Influx Data Community, I think it's called. Um, and I'll share links with that at the end as well. Um, or if you just want to talk about time series in general or anything outside this presentation, I, I would love that too. So um, but today uh, I'm gonna focus on introducing logs, traces, and metrics and kind of describing the difference. Then I'll give a brief introduction to what open telemetry is. Um, then I'll talk about InfluxDB Cloud, which is powered by IOX or basically V3, the new storage engine. We call it IOX because um, IOX is iron oxide, which is the chemical symbol for rust and it's written all in rust, ha ha. <laughs> And then uh, I'll give a quick intro to this actual demo uh, called InfluxDB Observability, um, which uses Jaeger Grafana, this hot route application that Jaeger built to like create sample um, applications with microservices that we're collecting logs, metrics, and traces from. And then Telegraph, which is a collection agent um, that we use to take all of these metrics um, and then write them to InfluxDB before uh, putting them in Jaeger and then visualizing them in Grafana as well. Um, and then last but not least, we'll talk about a variety of learning, learning resources that you can use to learn more about everything discussed here uh, so that you can get started. Um, so yeah, quick introductions to log traces and metrics. Um, basically, uh, I, I borrowed this graphic from metrics, traces, and logging. Um, and essentially, Logs are records of discrete events or messages. You know, we all probably familiar with those already. Um, while traces provide an end-to-end -end visibility into the execution um, path of a request um, or operation across any distributed system or microservice. And then metrics are the actual, um, you know, numerical values that represent um, the measurements of specific attributes of the system that we're monitoring. Um, but all the three things are time series data because they all happen in a particular time and usually contain a time series or a time stamp within that. So um, that's part of the reason why we use something like InfluxDB or a time series database to store both logs, traces, and metrics. Um, and so open telemetry, what is open telemetry? Well, it's an observability framework that provides a unified way to collect, uh, process, and export telemetry data. In other words, logs, traces, and metrics from applications, from microservices, and what it does is it aims to simplify the, in the instrumentation and integration of multiple monitoring tools uh, by standardizing uh, the API and the data model. Um, so in the context of uh, logs, traces, and metrics, OpenTelemetry supports capturing log data um, by allowing users to record events or messages that occur during the execution. Um, and it can integrate with a lot of different logging libraries and offers that structured logging capability um, so that we have that unified approach. And then with traces, uh, it also provides a tracing API 
um, that allows users to instrument their applications and services to capture end-to-end -end traces of requests. Um, and it makes it really easy to integrate with a variety of uh, tracing tools, things like Jaeger, which we'll talk about, Zipkin um, as well. And then um, for metrics, uh, it also includes a metrics API um, for capturing and exporting metrics as well. And the metrics can be uh, you know, sent to a variety of different monitoring uh, backends. InfluxDB is one, but you know, Prometheus is another popular one. So now I also want to give a uh, kind of brief overview of InfluxDB and Telegraph, because those are two of the other tools that we'll be using in this demo. So um, Influx Data is a creator of InfluxDB and Telegraph. And InfluxDB Cloud uh, is a real-time monitoring platform for time series data specifically. And Telegraph uh, is an open source collection agent for metrics and events. Um, InfluxDB v3 uh, is only offered as a cloud offering right now. The OSS offering will come out very shortly, sometime later this year. We're just a little bit behind on creating that build and distributing it. Um, and uh, I did want to take a little bit of time in a second to talk about the new InfluxDB engine, um, just because the technology and the overhaul that we did with this version um, is pretty exciting. Um, and then take some time to talk about Telegraph as well, because uh, it's a hugely popular tool. It's really easy to use. Um, and so if you haven't used it before and you have a, a task of gathering data from a variety of different inputs, sending it to an output, maybe doing some processing or some aggregation, um, highly recommend looking into it. Um, there's also these ExecD plugins that make Telegraph extensible in any language of your choice. So Basically what it does is it like, you have to pipe metrics to standard out or standard in, depending on whether or not you're using an input plugin or an output plugin or an aggregator plugin. Um, and as long as you follow those protocols, then you can you know, manipulate and gather data from wherever you want. Uh, so um, you can still take advantage of all of the capabilities that the agent has to offer, like all the buffering and caching capabilities, flushing um, capabilities, the interval, Etc. Um, so that you, you know, essentially if your service is down for a while, you have a very robust way of collecting data and you can do that in whatever language that you want to pick. Um, if there isn't already a plugin available for you. Um, and then it's really easy to contribute to those external plugins as well. Um, and if anything, I'm also, if you don't have questions, but you also just want me to talk about one thing in more detail too, or learn more about it, let me know too, because I'm, I'm happy to like, you know, cater this presentation to what y'all are interested in. Um, that being said, though, I did want to take a quick moment to talk a little bit more about InfluxDB um, 3.0. So InfluxDB 3.0 uh, is written in Rust. And the reason why we chose Rust is because it offers really fine uh, memory management. And one of the main concerns with previous versions of InfluxDB was that it would eat up a lot of memory. Um, and so, and additionally, users wanted more control over that memory management. So Rust was the obvious choice for that so that we could give that to users. Um, it's also entirely built on the um, Apache ecosystem. So it uses Apache Arrow as its framework for defining in columnar memory, in memory columnar data, excuse me, and Apache uh, Parquet as its column oriented uh, durable file format. And then it uses Arrow Flight to uh, transport the, the Arrow um, data uh, over network interfaces. And it uses Data Fusion, Apache Data Fusion, um, as a query execution framework. Uh, data Fusion is also written in Rust. And it also uses Apache Arrow as its in memory format. And I think previously, Influx had prioritized, you know, contributing to open source, meaning building like one singular product that offered all of these features. Um, and Influx CB V3 uh, has a lot less features because we decided we're going to be contributing, like the goal of open source is to contribute to projects upstream that then can fuel um, more open source projects and that there's more interoperability among all of these tools. Uh, so I'm really happy to see that shift. Um, in the engineering approach, um, just because I think it has a more meaningful impact. And while it's nice if you can like 
download something with a single binary and like instantly like have all these tools. No, no, no one tool is going to have everything that you need. So for me, like any tool that offers really easy interoperability with other tools that I'm interested in, uh, I get more excited about that. Um, and another uh, fun thing about InfluxDB v3 is just like the benchmarks that are coming out are already really exciting. Um, it provides uh, 45 better, 45 times better write throughput over previous OSS versions um, and 4.5 better storage compression compared to previous versions. And if you have, I'm trying to remember the, the dimensionality of the data set. Um, if you have a dimensionality or cardinality of like 160,000, you can now write over 4.3 4 million points per second. Um, happy to share. Let me actually go ahead and share that with you and also this blog as well. And so kind of a big reason why everything was rewritten for 3.0 was because we not only wanted to offer users um, man the ability to manage uh, their memory and could have operator control over it, but also um, to not have to worry about cardinality anymore um, and not have to worry about downsampling their data and kind of their data life cycle. Um, the idea is, is that InfluxCBB3 should support unlimited cardinality. Obviously, from an engineering perspective, that's not really feasible, but as near to unlimited as we can can get um, and really prioritize uh, really high reads and writes um, so that you can uh, have a centralized place to store all your logs, metrics, and traces, um, and then, you know, send them where you need to, uh, as you need to, or as you need to process them. Um, that's another exciting thing is that previously, like while technically we could store logs, we really weren't optimized for that. Uh, now we are. So that that opens up so much more. Um, but for today, for this demo, um, what we're gonna be talking about is this intro introduction to Influx CB observability. That's the name of it. Um, it's in the Influx community organization. And the Influx community organization is also where we have a bunch of projects um, that are maintained by the community and the developer advocates, myself included. Um, also where you can find example projects that use a lot of other technologies with Influx CB. So if you're like wondering like, oh, like, how can I use Kafka and InfluxDB together? You can find a demo there, or like, how can I use um, any like any type of other stream processing um, tool with InfluxDB? There's examples for like Quix and Mage. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a great place to go. There's a ton of IoT demos in there as well. Um, if you just want to get started on you know also creating like a plant monitoring application or um, soon we'll add a demo for, uh, this fun robotic arm. Um, so yeah, so there's like a lot of inspiration to be gained there. That's also where all of our client libraries, uh, exist as well. So great resource to have. Um, but yeah, but open telemetry with InfluxCB, here's a, the QR code again, sorry, redundant, but, uh, yeah, you can scan that to go there as well. Um, so this is just kind of what we're aiming to do is provide a standard way for converting open telemetry data into an influx DB schema and an influx DB schema into open telemetry. Um, and parts of this can be replaced with telegraph as you need, but basically what we're doing is it's all dockerized and we have uh, Jaeger running um, as well as this hot rod sample application that creates like these errors from, you know, imaginary microservices um, that are then uh, in the open telemetry standard that we then write to influx CB with telegraph in this example. And then we write, and then we query them with Jaeger. And then we look at them with the Jaeger UI and Grafana um, with a full dashboard. Um, so we've already kind of been through this already, um, but basically, yeah, the hot rods, um, hot ride on demand is a sample application that was developed by Jaeger um, to demonstrate Jaeger's tracing capabilities. And it is supposed to mimic, I forgot this detail, a, a ride sharing application. Um, and Jaeger, I guess we didn't technically talk about what Jaeger is already, but it's an open source distributed tracing platform um, as well as UI that we're gonna be using to monitor and troubleshoot our imaginary distributed uh, system hot rod. Um, and we're gonna store those open telemetry traces in InfluxDB. 
uh, so that ideally we can you know, identify any bottlenecks that we have in our system. Um, so yeah, this is kind of like a full architecture diagram where we're also sending uh, or visualizing those metrics, not only in Jaeger, um, where we're looking at, uh, oh, I forgot what the graph is, those graphs are called with the, you know what I'm talking about, but we also have a full dashboard to not only visualize the traces, but also to visualize the, the metrics. Um, so here's a QR code for uh, the GitHub repo that has the hot rods application. Um, we'll spin it up in a second, so we'll get to actually see what it looks like, but this is um, what it is. Uh, and some of the features of this application include um, that you can view request timeline errors um, to try and understand how the application works. The idea here is that it help you find sources of latency and lack of concurrency. Um, and also um, attribute time spent in a particular service. And uh, it uses open source libraries with open tracing integration um, to get like a vendor neutral instrumentation for free. Uh, and then Jaeger, um, one of the you know fun things about Jaeger or useful things is like this dependency graph. That's what I was trying to remember the name of earlier. Um, which you know helps us visualize the relationships and dependencies between different services in our distributed system, so we can understand how these different services communicate with each other, and um, actually understand the direction of calls, uh, so that we can identify those bottlenecks and find those latency issues, and um, you know maybe identify any error prone service. Um, so yeah, so. Um Yes. I just had a question on on Jaeger. Is it is Jaeger an open telemetry implementation or are those two separate things? I I got confused about that. I thought they were kind of the same thing, and, but are think, they, what's the difference? I think it implements the open telemetry standard, um, but I don't know beyond that. I'm sure someone. I feel like someone else on this call though might have a really good answer to that. That's that's what I thought it was because Jaeger was around before Open Telemetry, and then Open Telemetry kind of became the standard. And I think, but it was all about open. It was all about tracing. Open tracing was kind of the. I believe. So, I believe it was it, it implemented open tracing when it first came out, and it was this super simplified UI. And then when Open Telem came out, it, they implemented it also. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think I was around. Well, not like I physically was around, but I don't think I was in this space in open when open tracing was around. So <laughs> I only know of Jaeger implementing um, open telemetry. Uh, do you know if they still? Anyways. I, I, I'm not sure. I just uh, remember there was a blog post about them uh, doing open telem. And I, th I think Jaeger at the beginning, it was like back when, when it was mainly done by the Uber people that, that implemented open tracing. And I remember that post being also by the same group. Uh, um, and then after that, I honestly haven't used Jaeger. I've been just using Elastic and, and Flux myself. So yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then last not, but not least, and thank you for that question for, for answering. Um, thank you all. Um, and then last but not least, we'll use this, um, hotel dashboard um, to visualize some of the metrics, uh, logs and traces as well um, in Grafana. So we can have everything centralized in one place. Oh, that is another huge difference between um, Influx CBB3 is we really deprioritized uh, the UI as well um, with the understanding that people want to use other uh, UI options like Grafana. Um, and now there's also interoperability with Tableau, Apache Superset. Um, and uh, I think we're working on some final bugs for Power BI. Um, so yeah, if anyone wants more info on that as well, I'm happy to give it to you. Um, but so, that being said, yeah. So did they, have they deprecated their, I can't remember what the product was, but you had a UI tool that was kind of a competitor with Grafana. If you were just want, if you just want to do influx everything, you, and I think that's what you're talking about is 
Influx had a full package you could use. But it sounds like the strategy now going forward is focusing mostly on the time series and the components that then can be used with with other parts. So is, can you still use the other other UI tool or is it going away? So in version 1.x, there was a chronograph. So all of the components of InfluxDB, the data processing engine, the UI, and then the actual database, they're all separate. Um, in InfluxDB 2 and onward, they became unified. Um, but in InfluxDB 3, we had like a, a notebooks feature, we had a dashboarding feature, and then in V3, we kind of... Um, deprecated those uh, in favor of just an explorer. So you can, you know, make, you know, verify that you have your data, perform your SQL queries or your influx QL queries in V3. Um, but yeah, the idea being that we're not trying to also become a dashboarding solution uh, and people are already, you know, using their, the solutions are already using for that. So yeah, focusing on interoperability for that. Um, and that was a, a, another thing that I forgot to mention with V3, um, we went back to uh, native support for InfluxQL, which is the SQL-like query language for InfluxDB, and then also added support for SQL. The other really exciting thing for me about using Data Fusion under the hood is that it also has a Pandas API. So I'm hoping that eventually we'll also support Pandas natively, um, and you could do uh, some of your data querying and transformation directly with Pandas, which would make which would make me happy. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can use InfluxDB Cloud um, to just like explore your data and, and see what's there, but um, you can't like save any dashboards, but you can save scripts or your queries. So if there are common queries that you want to look at, yeah, you can do that. Uh, yeah. Um, so how to run this? Uh, I mean, I'll, we'll do it in just a second. Um, basically, you want to create an in file um, and then put in your authentication credentials from InfluxDB Cloud or um, the OSS version when it comes out. Um, sorry, I realized I just blocked part of your view. Um, and I think you have to install Flight SQL as part of the readme. I actually don't know if you need to do that anymore. I think it might be updated. And then you wanna build and run your Docker images. Um, and then last but not least, you're just gonna have to import your dashboard as a JSON into Grafana to actually see it. And then you wanna actually create traces by clicking on a customer on the hot red application. And we'll do all this in just a second. So, um, and when you set up Grafana, just know that your username and your password will both be admin. Um, and you want to select your flight SQL source and your Jaeger source. Um, so yeah, now if you're connecting and that's true for influx CBB three in general, if you're using Grafana, um, you're going to connect via the flight SQL, um, plugin. Uh, since that's what um, uh, InfluxDB is using. So yeah, uh, now let me, give me a second just to get all my tabs all organized and then I will share my full screen. Um, all right, question. Uh, mm -hmm. The Flight SQL plugin is used for what? Oh, for Grafana, um, that's just how we're querying. Uh, nice. Yeah, because um, InfluxDB uses Flight SQL under the hood, and all of our client libraries, they either wrap um, the Flight SQL uh, client or they wrap just the Flight client, um, which allows you to query either in SQL or uh, in Python. I want to say, I don't even remember. Um, yeah. So is, well, you wouldn't use, so Influx QO, what, is it supported in Grafana then? Yes. Is that what you'd use? You use Flight SQL to do the translation between that and Influx? Um, but you can query with SQL directly in Grafana. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I actually don't know if Influx QL support through Flight, Flight SQL is available yet in Grafana. I think you'd, for V3, I think you'd query in SQL. That's a great okay. question. Um, so 
Sorry, I just need a couple more seconds. Okay. Um, so this is actually, I should have done this like a little while ago because it's just taking, it's going to take a couple seconds to get everything up and running. But I guess in the meantime, we can kind of like take a peek at the file structure for this. Um, basically, you're going to put your... Uh, whoa. are your credentials in the .n file. Um, and specifically, that's like the one of the bigger differences between previous versions. Like this is how you're gonna specify the address. Um, and then we have um, our Docker Compose where we're running our, our query, our Giger query, query service, our Giger Influx DB service, where we're actually, um, writing those metrics um and then uh grafana as well um and there we go hopefully and so now we're gonna like click on a customer name to order a car uh, and hopefully find some traces later. That shouldn't be it. And I did, I will say I am pulling from a version of this demo that might still have some bugs in it, which it looks like it does. So I'm actually gonna go back to a previous version. Um, wait. Hold on. Yeah. What? I thought it existed in there. Give me a second. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, so now I will do the same thing I did before, and then I can go to the Jaeger UI and try and find some traces. And there we can see we have some traces. We can see, you know, some details about how we got those traces and and what's going on. Um, where honestly, like. I start to be like, oh, I'm not a DevOps engineer. Um, <laughs> and we can go to Grafana. And if we want to, we can, as I've already logged in, I can go ahead and go to my dashboards and import one and gather one from I need the YAML though. I'm trying to remember where that is. Or the JSON, sorry. I think it's this one. And then we get our durations and our service latency. And sometimes uh, there's a small error in the query, which I don't know what it is right now. So I apologize. I don't even understand what happened earlier, but I think it has something to do with um, some aggregation that's going on. Uh, so, oh, I'm so sorry about that. I apologize. Well, 
Well, the data is coming through, so I don't know why the histogram isn't working. Oh, actually, I think I do know. I think this is actually um, a coworker's working on a pull request to help uh, Grafana have better visualization for some of this data. Um, so I can share that link to you as well. Um, so I guess this is a still a little bit of a work in progress, but that's basically the entire idea. I think also um, worth looking at like the telegraph configuration um, where we see we're outputting to InfluxDB. It says v2, but because the right API is the same for v2 and v3, we can still use it. And then um, we're uh, using the inputs of Prometheus metrics and we're doing a little bit of name passing and uh, processing those with regex. Um, and that's uh, pretty much it. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll take, oops, sorry. So I'll stop sharing and see now if anyone has any questions about this demo or um, wants to go into anything in more detail. Um, let me share one second. So here's the tutorial where he mo um, modified Grafana's source code in case you want some more info on that um, to, to kind of address some of the problems in this. And I, I don't think all of those changes have been added um, to the demo yet. Uh, so we're in the process of, of doing that um, so that all of those cells will always work without any without having to finesse something. And I can't remember what it is that I'm supposed to finesse right now to get get those to visualize. Uh, yeah. But does anyone have any specific questions or any other like areas of interest that they might want more information on or um, yeah, let me know. I have some questions, but I don't want to take over the whole meeting. Do other people have questions on the demo or influx in general? I, I had a question then, I guess, about um, the the plugins, uh, the Telegraph plugins, right? Those are the ones that they were like standard ones for like different databases and things like that. Are those all, are they, are all the 301 still available that were there in 1.0? Yes, and more. There's probably been a lot more that have been created, yeah. Okay. And also... Maybe is could you show us a little on how do you create like if you had a custom plugin that wasn't a standard one, but you wanted to write it so you could collect the data. So maybe it's an, it would be application specific. Maybe you're some metrics you're trying to capture, and you wanted to tie into your time series. Sure. Yeah. Give me one second to pull up some things to help with that. So I just created um, a repo or shared a rep an example um, where we used the execd processor plugin as well as an input plugin to gather metrics um, from a Python script that was like rereading uh, metrics in real time gathered by uh, coworkers uh, home brewing setup. And then um, the execd processor plugin was responsible for batching that data in really small batches and then using um, Holt Winters or triple exponential smoothing to generate mini forecasts that we then wrote back to InfluxDB um, with each agent interval uh, so that we could like, you know, basically alert in real time whether or not the temperature of the brewing setup was, you know, getting out of hand. Um, and want to share with you a quick slide on how those exec D plugins work. And do you, do you still have to write the plugin in Go or do you support other no, languages? No, you write it in whatever language you want. And so here, I, I want just give me two seconds and then. Um, doop -a -doop. 
So this is kind of the example of the architecture for the exec D plugins. So you can have that as an input plugin, a processor plugin, an aggregator plugin, an output, out, output plugin. Um, the difference is what you're, where you're, where it expects the metrics to be coming from and to. Um, so if you have a custom input plugin, you have to make sure to pipe metrics to standard out with line protocol. If you're using a processor plugin, the expectation is that they are coming from standard in, and then again, you put them to standard out. And same thing with our aggregator and custom output plugin reads metrics inline protocol from standard in. So those are the kind of the only requirements. Um, and so, for example, uh, if we are using like the exec D processor plugin, we'd have this command Python and what we actually want to be running and This would be like the simplest example possible um, where we're just reading every line from standard in and then printing them to standard out. But in that, um, in this repo where we're doing our forecasting, basically what we were doing was we were creating these mini batches and writing and creating predictions and then um, putting that into line protocol before uh, sending that to standard out. Um, so does that help? Answer the question. Yeah. Quickly. Okay. Yeah, that's a big improvement. I, at least early days, it, you had to write them in Go. It seemed like, and that was could be a problem sometimes. And then worth noting as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's also this list of external plugins here um, that shows how to contribute, but also um, somewhere contains all of the example, all of the lists of them. There you go, we click on them. So even though there's like whatever, however many hundred input plugins, et cetera, people have also contributed uh, external plugins this way and you're welcome to do that as well. Um, so yeah, another good resource if you like Telegraph. Cool. Uh, by the way, for the for the you know the processor plugins and uh, and and all that, like, do do you guys have uh, a repo where you standardize all these interfaces? Uh, um, for example, like I'm a Go dev, so and, and Go, like it instead of someone telling me that this has to come from standard or anything, just tells me like implement this interface and call it good. Uh, uh do like for different languages, do you guys have uh, something that standardizes those so that people don't screw it up on that um so i think for the exact plugins because you can use whatever language you want there's not very much standardization as, aside from the requirements that it be standard in and standard out but for the rest of the plugins you just use a telegraph configuration um, you specify in like the config generation command the plugins that you want to use for input and output and then yeah there's just the options that are available for that plugin. And then if you are going to contribute an actual plugin in Go, there are like strict requirement um, contribution guidelines. I see, I see. Okay. That's that that was just more of my question. Should have phrased that better. Thank you. No, no, no. I just took me a second. Yeah. I had to talk it out loud before I understood what you were asking. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. One, one difficulty I have uh, when I'm guiding dev teams and adding application observability is like how to select the different instrument types, like when to do traces versus metrics versus logs, uh, in addition to like cardinality and like whether something's request scoped or not. Like what are some of the other kind of heuristics you, you use to like guide dev teams? I don't guide dev teams and I'm not very involved in, <laughs> in guiding them or monitoring applications. Uh -huh. My focus is actually more around personally around um, data analytics and statistics and forecasting and anomaly detection um, mm -hmm. and IoT. Uh, so I, I'm actually not a good resource for asking that. Um, I have the same question. And if anyone else has an answer, <laughs> I would love to know. Um, all I, all I will say, and I don't have direct experience with it to, to like personally be able to guarantee it is that at least like, I think, um, 
you can have tables as wide as 200 columns in InfluxDB, and um, you're not supposed to have to worry about the cardinality. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully, maybe, I don't know if that actually creates other more problems in, in not having those limitations. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's a really good question, though. I think that's a common one we run into, where there's kind of a divide between development and operations, and and the operations people just put, hey, well, CPU memory, we're showing all that, and then the application, well, the app doesn't work, and and there's a big gap of, hey, we really need to monitor this. It would tell us, you know, this particular interface is broken or it's running slow, and it's kind of an art form, I think, but I. I get frustrated of that a lot too. And <laughs> it'd be good to have some white papers trying to make that gap a little smaller. Yeah, I, I've spent the last, I don't know, four months getting my organization ready to adopt open telemetry across all of our services. And and we've built all this documentation about here's how you add the open telemetry SDK to your app, depending on your language. And then, and like, we're about to start adopting across hundreds of devs. And it's like, oh, oh, you want to actually do something with this data? Oh man, how dare you? Yeah. <laughs> I will say too, and I don't know if this is, I, ha I haven't actually like, my goal is to build a demo on top of this data using, I, I recently fell in love with this open source tool called mage.ai. Um, and you can build uh, streaming pro uh, pipelines really easily. Um, it's all open source and it's built on Kafka in the back end. Um, and I really like it. And I've been curious to learn more about this and and try and figure out like, yeah, what what should I be monitoring um, and how and how can I use this data to actually like do something what you know meaningful and and get into those intricacies more, but I, yeah, I've really been enjoying that tool as well. So if anyone, I don't know. Yeah, that's is, the one. Is, that's the one. Mm -hmm. That sounds cool. It's open source. Completely. Yeah. I actually don't know how they make money. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Look at that. Oh, thanks, Stephen. Yeah, it's a good post. Well, thank you. Yeah, it, it's very, the post is really good. It makes you think, but it's all very high level and it it's maybe lacking a little in like practical specific steps for like, like that would tell a dev team what to use. That'd be more like level setting and telling them their, their options, but but not really a good heuristic or flow chart for a team to follow to, to decide, oh my, this is what my data looks like. This is the question I'm trying to answer. Uh, and that's kind of the sort of thing I'm, I want to find somewhere. Well, thank you everyone for all of your questions and for um, adding your, your thoughts as well. I appreciate it. Thank you, Anais, for presenting today, for having this conversation. We really appreciate your presence here and for sharing all this great information with us. Thank you. Did anyone yeah. have any last minute questions, anything that they wanted to toss out there? This was a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. We have another presentation next month. So everyone RSVP, it'll be another online virtual one. Thank you. We'll catch y'all then. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Katrina. Yeah, thank you, Brett. Thanks,